call this special meeting. special meeting of the Salem City Council to order for October 21st, if the recorder please call the roll. Councilor Kayser? Councilor Anderson? Councilor Nanke? I thought I did. Councilor Leung? Here. Councilor Osick? Here. Councilor Hoy? Here. Ward 7 is vacant. Councilor Lewis? Here. Mayor Bennett? Here, and I will correct that. This is a meeting of the City Council right now. Okay. We join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> need a motion for the approval of the special meeting agenda. I move approval of the special meeting agenda. Second, Second by Osik. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion passes. Any comments from the, uh, or any additions or deletions? No. no. Okay. Well, no. No. <laughs> okay. Final answer. Final answer. Okay, yeah, final I'm answer is no. <laughs> Anyone have a comment? They want to take advantage of this opportunity? Anything going on in your lives? Oh, I knew it, Nikki. You had that. Yeah, it's just I got to sit in for the mayor on Saturday morning at the uh, the convention for uh, uh, the blind that had their annual conference uh, down at the uh, now Holiday Inn, previously Red Lion. Uh, Great meeting, great folks. It's always wonderful when we can talk to each other. Um, it, it's similar to League of Oregon Cities, and in this case, talking about people. Um, and I learned something fascinating. How do you tell the difference between shampoo and conditioner when you have limited sight capabilities in a hotel room? You can't. Oh, um, good. So, you know, we, we, we think about our everyday. I hadn't thought about and that. And it's like, but because there's, they all have to look the same. Uh, and then the print sometimes is real teeny. I can't even read shampoo or conditioner without these on it. I feel sorry for, uh, it's like, do you smell? Um, some, I guess, are starting to put little dots on. One for shampoo, two dots for, ah. for conditioner as well. But, you know, I learned something new. And that's, I think, our goal. Every day we should learn at least one new thing. Very good. Well, thank you very much for sitting in on that for me. Yeah, I really great. appreciate great it. Great meeting. Good. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? All righty, Mr. Manager, Acting Manager for tonight. Okay, our uh, special order of business this evening is appointment of a counselor for Ward 7. Uh, City Attorney, you want to take us through how this is going to work tonight? Uh, thank you, Dan Atchison, City Attorney. Just real briefly, I wanted to uh, run by the procedures with everyone so we're all on the same page. Um, there'll be a, a series of questions. We'll go um, alphabetically from counselor to counselor, start it, or excuse me, from candidate to candidate, uh, starting with Ward 1. Um, each candidate, uh, before we start questions, will have an opportunity to make an opening statement. Um, if the candidates could limit their opening statement and responses to their questions to about three minutes, we, we have time tonight, given the, there's only two candidates instead of three to be interviewed. But nonetheless, if you could try to limit your answers to the extent possible. Um, counselors are encouraged not to ask follow-up questions, so you're going to each have an opportunity to ask at least one question as we go around the room. Um, please try not to ask follow-up questions to, to limit uh, and make sure everyone has an opportunity to ask at least one question. Um, as far as voting goes, there's ballots um, at your desks. Um, as soon as one candidate has a majority, which will be five votes, that, can that candidate is then appointed. If uh, there's a tie vote or no one reaches a majority, you'll keep voting until there is. All righty, very good, thank you. Is that all clear to everybody? Okay, very good. Um, well, welcome this evening. We're very pleased that uh, we are ending up with two people who are available to serve in this capacity. 
Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, give you a chance to begin with your uh, opening remarks, and it's about three minutes. Uh, take, take what you need within, within that kind of confine, if you could, and we'll start with you, Ms. Nordyke. Good evening, Mayor, and thank you. Pull up the there. closer. There you go. Oh yeah, I can tell the difference. You know the routine. Right on. Good evening, Mayor and City Council, and everyone who's watching. I want to join Salem City Council because Salem is in my blood. I'm a third-generation Salem lawyer. I've served on four <coughs> City of Salem boards and commissions: the Salem Youth Advisory Commission, the Social Services Advisory Board the Community Police Review Board, and last but certainly not least, the Citizen Budget Committee. My dedication to this community goes back to my childhood. I was born and raised in the area that comprises Ward 7, the seat that I'm here for today. My friends and I played in Nelson Park. We rode bikes in our neighborhoods, and we even put up a lemonade stand. Because of this, I know just how important it is to have safe, and walkable and bikeable neighborhoods for our families. In junior high, I got my first taste of community service at the Salem Art Association's annual art fair in Bush Park. I was walking past the kids' court section, and I saw a long line of little boys and girls who were waiting to have their faces painted. Well, I am no da Vinci, but I do have some basic painting skills. And I saw some extra paint brushes. I saw an extra paint set and I saw an empty seat at the table. So I sat down at that empty seat at the table, and I motioned over the next person in line. I was 13 years old, and I learned a valuable lesson that day. If you see a need, and you have the means, just do it. Don't wait. I also learned how cultural events like the art fair help shape our local economy and our identity as a gathering spot for all cultures. In high school, I worked part-time at Ranch Records, a locally owned small business in downtown Salem. We not only contributed to the music scene, we were a welcoming space for everyone, for artists, for musicians, for music lovers, for kids, for kids who didn't feel like they quite fit in, and many more people. We supported other businesses. We bought our stationery from Cook's. We bought our coffee from Governor's Cup. So I have learned firsthand what it is to be a member of the downtown business community and to understand that to be a part of a small business is to be a part of a larger ecosystem and to contribute to what our city's image is. Also in high school, I joined the Salem Youth Advisory Commission and we helped together organize a forum at the Salem Public Library for over 100 teenagers around the city to discuss issues like drug use and teen pregnancy and more. This is where I had my first interaction with city government. And this is where I learned how the city can bring people together. As I mentioned, I went on to serve on three more boards. And on each and every one of those, I learned more and more about our community partners and our stakeholders. I had the pleasure of serving with Councillor Cook on the Community Police Review Board, where she learned firsthand about my ideas and my willingness to collaborate and build consensus with everyone and to listen to everyone. My commitment to Salem has only deepened over time. So recently, Councillor Cook asked me to step up and encouraged me to apply. And she knows me from serving on CPRB and the Budget Committee. I served as Vice Chair while she served most recently as our Chair. I've earned the support of many others in Ward 7, people who know me, people who grew up with me, people who believe in me. I stand ready to join Salem City Council and I will apply everything that I have learned over all these years that I've given to the city. And I will use my professional training to analyze the issues and ask tough questions. And I will treat all of my peers with the utmost respect. And I will run for this seat. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Mr. Sun. All right, well, first of all, thank you, Vanessa, for stepping up and for being here, and I've enjoyed uh, 
the little time we've had to uh, get to know one another on the budget committee. And thank you to council for being here on yet another another Monday night. Uh, and the mayor, city attorney, and chief of police, thank you for being here. Um, my story is a little different, but I do believe that I am a product of Salem. I grew up here, was born here at Salem Hospital, <laughs> funny enough, which is where I work now. My mom has worked there for uh, nearly 40 years. Uh, my dad, retired school teacher from South, uh, who's here tonight, um, along with my wife. Very thankful for their support. Uh, I went to Judson Middle School. I was the first ever inaugural Judson Jaguar mascot, which was very <laughs> embarrassing as a seventh grader to put on a Jaguar suit with an open face so everyone knew who I was. After graduating from high school, I left, and I honestly can say to you, I thought to myself, I am never going back to Salem, Oregon. Uh, not for any reason other than I wanted to continue to live on the beach in San Diego and surf, and that was going to be my life. But yet, here we are, and I'm in the council chambers talking to all of you, and quite thankful that I am, because I was blessed to have an opportunity to come back to Salem, uh, quite randomly, to work at Salem Health, uh, my wife and I moved up. She was pregnant uh, with our first at the time, Charlie. He's three and a half now. Since then, we've had another uh, little boy, Polly Joe, we call him. He's one and a half. Uh, and we have another one on the way, baby girl, coming here in December, hopefully not tonight. So uh, we are raising our family here, and our roots are here. Uh, I love this town. I have enjoyed so thoroughly getting to know the people of my community. Uh, the people at the hospital that I interact with on day in and day out, uh, the, the, the wonderful people in the downtown area. Uh, it's just been a pleasure. Uh, I currently serve as the Director of Finance for Salem Health. I started out there as the controller and was recently promoted. Uh, great team. I would say that the one thing that brings me the most joy about what I do is the people I work with. Uh, they produce excellent results, just as the city staff here in the Finance Department and Budget Department do that helps us make meaningful decisions about how we're going to impact the care for our community being the sole community hospital. I'm a CPA, uh, and I'm also pursuing my MBA online, which I have one more term. Uh, I have also filed for the seat uh, for Ward 7, and I believe that my perspective uh, in Ward 7, uh, I really appreciated that, our, that Sally was uh, on the council as, uh, as a working mother raising, uh, raising her kids. And I believe that uh, a working uh, parent with, uh, with r young kids raising them in Salem is an important perspective on this council. I think what I see is the future. I look a lot at the past of how Salem uh, has shaped me and now I'm back. And, but mostly I think about what do I want for the future. I truly can say, after living here now for almost five years again, that I want my kids to raise their kids here, to roam the streets, to go walk across the bridge to Minto, to enjoy Riverfront Park, and to enjoy the incredible food that we have. So uh, I love Salem, and I'm very thankful for this opportunity to be here tonight. Great. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thank you very much. All right, uh, we're going to take a, a few minutes then for counselors to ask questions. I'm going to begin with Councillor Kayser. You have a list or you can make it up. Surprise everybody. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a prepared question. Ah, okay. It's not on the list. <laughs> ah, excellent. But, um, and as far as who to direct it at first, who, whoever? You, you just All right. pick. You okay, can. well, I'll read, I'll, I'll pick on you since All right. you went second, so now you can go first for this question. Sorry. And it is, in your opinion, what is the most pressing issue facing the city of Salem at this time? And if appointed, what is your plan specifically as a counselor to address it? In my opinion, and I think there are several that come to mind uh, as you ask that question, and many have asked it as we started to go out into the community and talk to, to one another. Uh, but in my opinion, I truly think that the issue uh, that, that's facing, that, that's most highly critical is homelessness. Um, I, I've lived in big cities. I've lived in San Diego uh, on the outskirts in, in, in closer to central area. I was just recently in New York City last week um, visiting for work and uh, expected something different than I, than I thought I would see there, uh, or I expected something different, and I walked away with 
with an interesting perspective given how dense New York is. And I think the community from people that in my own neighborhood, you know, I live in the sort of edge of Salem. And so I could, av I could avoid downtown or areas that I know are hot spots. But, you know, homeless people are people. They're my friends. They're our community. They live here too. They have a voice and they are not an issue. And so that's the first thing I would say. But at the same time, we have to think about uh, how do we face these challenges as Salem is growing and we are an enjoyable and livable place to be. Um, and so I think that this is an issue that is most um, pressing for this appointed seat because it's in front of us with the potential sit lie ordinance, with community uh, involvement in those forums and a lot of feedback um, and a lot happening in the area. So specifically, I think that affordable housing, the housing first model is paramount. And I have continued now to read more and I would love to continue to do that. I'm a learning machine. I love to read and learn. And so I don't have an answer of here's my 10 point plan, but I can tell you that housing first is paramount. Balanced with the being able to measure what is the return on the investment on taxpayer dollars. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we can't get um, those that are challenged with homeless into housing first and let them be who they are and then come alongside with services. So meeting them where they're at. Uh, that's, a, that's a phrase we've used in Young Life uh, when I was on Young Life staff and across the young, mission of Young Life is meet these kids where they're at. I think it's the same for you and for me and for them. Not here's a house but you have to do these 27 things and you've got to do them by tomorrow. So that's one thing that I think is important and I would look forward to talking with the community of incredible service providers that we have in Salem to do more. Thank you. So I agree with homelessness being our top priority and it's demonstrated by the City of Salem survey that everyone agrees that by a large percentage that the consensus is that homelessness should be our top priority, which informs what my top priorities are. So the city should ensure through coordination, technical assistance to social services providers, as well as our own financial resources, that members who are victims of domestic abuse or living in unsafe environments should find and have a place to live. I agree that affordable housing is paramount. But I also think that we need to look at the root causes of homelessness because for many people, homelessness is just a single flat tire away. It's a single medical bill away. It's a single sick day away because when you live paycheck to paycheck, all it takes is a slight switch in your personal finances to find yourself evicted. As a mental health advocate, I know that raising awareness of and destigmatizing mental health can help connect folks with the mental health care and treatment that they need. I think that the city can help in terms of raising awareness, in terms of destigmatizing mental illness, and we can work on that with our community partners. Some of the things that we can do are the sorts of things that have been recommended by our downtown homelessness task force. Things like bathrooms and showers, warming centers, helping getting people connected with the services provided by community partners to lift people out of homelessness. As we move forward, we need to focus our limited resources on increasing community engagement and on getting results. I think that there are so many different steps that people as well as the city can do, whether it's creating the micro apartments, whether it is working with the homelessness rental assistance program, we already are doing a great deal in homelessness, but that doesn't mean that our work is finished. I think we agree that there's more that we can do and how can we balance that while looking at the limited resources that we have? And how can we do that while measuring results? Homelessness is ravaging the West Coast. It is a problem that goes to the core of who we are as human beings. And every person needs to be treated with dignity and respect. And there is so much more that I think we can do as a community to support folks. And so that is what we need to be looking at moving forward. There are many other priorities too that I hope we can discuss at other times. But I think that everyone agrees that homelessness is our top priority. 
and I look forward to rolling up my sleeves and working with City Council on how we can leverage our limited resources to make the most of it. Thank you. Councilor Anderson. I, too, am uh, going off script for a question, and I'll start with Vanessa since Reed had the first one last time. As elected officials or appointed officials in your two cases, we have to deal with other governmental units that are here uh, connected with our city. We've got the county, we have the transit district, we have the school board, we have the state government. And those are not only administrative people, but elected people. In fact, the governor, Governor Brown, lives in Ward 7. She will be one of your constituents. So I'm interested in you telling me how any experience you have had with dealing with the other elected officials, um, meaning um, the governor, the transit people, the school board, and the county, as well as any other experience you've had dealing with the actual administrative bodies, and how you think that will benefit uh, or not benefit the city if you are chosen as councilor. Thank you, Councilor Anderson, for the question. So it's important to develop relationships because I think relationships are how you get things done. Building trust and listening with community partners is incredibly important, and that's something that I pride myself on. So my involvement with a variety of elected officials runs the gamut. Uh, first of all, as Oregon State Bar President, I've met the governor. I've met the chief justice of the Supreme Court. I've met a lot of elected officials in my capacity as Oregon State Bar President. So they know my face and they know who I am. And they know about my passion for public service. The other types of folks that I know, um, certainly I know folks on the school board, like a lot of people do. And I also know some important community partners. Uh, years ago, I served on the Marion County Sheriff's Office Citizen Advisory Committee. I know that our county is an incredibly important partner with the city. And so being on the county-wide Citizens Advisory Committee, I got to meet a lot of other members and stakeholders of our community, and of course, our sheriff at the time, Jason Myers, who I understand, of course, is not in office any longer. But my familiarity with public safety issues is very strongly tied to my service with the Community Police Review Board and the Marion County Sheriff's Office. Another county-wide body that I've worked with is the Marion County Circuit Court. As the president of the Willamette Valley Inn of Court, that is a club made up of several judges and lawyers across Marion and Polk County. So I know a lot of the folks who do the business of running our judicial system locally. And our judges are well advised and very familiar with the quality of life crimes, the number of self-represented litigants, the businesses who are coming in to have contract disputes resolved. They are folks who are on the front lines in their own way of addressing community needs, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's crime. There are a variety of issues that our courts are apprised of. And I've worked closely with the Marion County Court in creating the Military Veterans Treatment Court. This was a treatment court that was created to help military veterans who are struggling with PTSD and TBI. And so I'm familiar with that process. That included working with the Public Defender's Office, the Center for Hope and Safety, and the, let's see, the veterans, uh, the VA was involved, the Oregon National Guard was involved. So there were a lot of community partners that I got to know in that way. In addition, I'm involved with neighborhood associations, and I've been involved with a variety of community service organizations over the year. And there's a great deal of overlap between a lot of the nonprofits in the area, whether it's Arches or the St. Francis Shelter or Community Action Center or the Rotary Clubs, for that matter, or the YMCA. There are a number of partner organizations who already know me and know of my commitment to service. And so, yes, I do think that would serve me well because they know that I am here to make a difference in the city of Salem. Well, my answer will be a little different. Uh, I, I uh, am raising a family. I spend most of my weekends and nights uh, with my wife and children at the park in the community. Uh, I will say that my 
ability to problem solve in a group of diverse people, no matter the scenario, uh, has served me well at, in my job currently at the hospital. I think ultimately what it comes down to is listening, problem solving with one another, uh, using process and outcome metrics to determine are we on the right track? Do we even know what the track is? Uh, I can tell you that in everything I've done in my life, the number one, my number one most favorite thing is just working with people. And again, my perspective is different. My perspective is a 30-something family dad working in the community and excited about the future of Salem and what that holds. Uh, so to answer the question directly, uh, no, my background has not really warranted a lot of community involvement with multiple government agencies. I do serve on the board of Isaac's Room, uh, which operates Ikebox and Isaac's and have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know the incredible mission of that organization. Um, but I think ultimately my blank slate coming to the table as a, a problem solver and critical thinker and my perspective in life right now in Salem, especially in Ward 7, would actually be beneficial for me if appointed to this seat. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Nanke. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't know if anybody's going to actually use any prepared questions tonight because I'm on my own here as well. Um, and it kind of gets back to critical thinking and trust. Um, <laughs> Previously in Ward 7, we've had land use issues where council had made a decision, staff had neglected to necessarily codify those decisions appropriately, and someone comes back 10 years later and says, um, well, there's no rule against it, so um, we're going to do this again, even though someone relied on a decision that council made at the time. Um, we have land use issues. We have long-term projects in, you know, the uh, Salem River crossing being one of those. How do you view previous decisions of council knowing that you're, we cannot bind a future council and what process you go through to look at decisions that, that previous councils may have made um, and through no error of the council themselves um, are, are being challenged and, and someone wants to wait, take away um, what someone else has relied upon for numerous years, uh, and and now all of a sudden the rules change on them. What what kind of process do you go through to say, yep, um, we're just going to change it because there's a loophole, um, or how do you how do you look at someone's interpretation of, of trust of the city and previous decisions made? I guess I'm yep. <clears throat> well. I think that when it comes to elected or appointed officials, when it comes to our government, I mean truly, when you think about it from city, council, the state, the governor, all the way up to the president himself, the most important thing from my living room, meaning when I'm at home with my family or I'm talking with my friends or I'm out in the community is trust. Uh, and with that comes an incredible amount of uh, respect for those that have decided, like you all, to, uh, to put yourself in a position to make tough decisions. Um, but with that also comes an understanding that we, uh, we are a city that has got here for a variety of reasons, and we must look at these decisions and say and with validity to the fact that they were made. Now, if there's loopholes, I, I personally believe that there needs to be transparency to the community. If we're going to do something that might go back on a previous decision, we need to be able to clearly articulate why this is what's best for our community, with, if it's, of course, within the legal parameters of the decision, and in order to move forward, knowing that times do change, the community is growing. Uh, we have different challenges today than we did when I was uh, growing up here, for sure. But I also think that at the end of the day, trust in those that are sitting behind the seats of the government uh, is paramount uh, oh, above, above all else when it comes to how I feel about whether or not my city is listening to the concerns that I have. So I think it is important. I don't think that I would say that uh, there's, a, there's an absolute here. 
that 100% of all decisions should be etched in a stone and filed away into a, uh, into, into a vault, but that we should understand how did we get here and how are we gonna move forward and why does this make sense if that decision actually gives you that fork in the road and explain it to the voters. More than anything, I think people just wanna understand why we're doing what we're doing, why, why any government is doing what they're doing for reasons that make sense to our community. Thank you, that's a great question. So I've served on more boards and task forces and commissions than you can shake a stick at. And every time I join a new organization, the first thing I want to do is to learn everything about that institution. Learn what has already been looked at. What are the decisions that have already been made? Ask questions about the organization and then decide, is there something that needs to be revisited? And that is something that you do only after you've talked to the decision makers, only after you've talked with your staff, in this case would be the city of staff. These are not decisions that you make lightly. A governing body that is constantly reversing course has no clear vision, has no clear agenda, and is extremely inefficient. So I think it's extremely important to look at what's already been done and to be data driven. For example, what were the assumptions that were baked into that assumption, into that decision in the first place? What was the data as it stood today? The city of Salem website says we're gonna grow 60,000 people by the year 2035. That's some relatively new information. And how is that going to drive city council's decisions moving down the road? Would it drive in a different direction than if the city were shrinking? I would say it probably would. Another thing, I certainly agree that trust is paramount, which is why I support having performance auditing for our city, because it can increase transparency and accountability and efficiency. One of the other things that I wanna keep in mind moving forward is that if I am fortunate enough to join council, one of the things that I've learned is to recognize and assume best intentions. Everyone on this council is here for free on their personal time because they believe in making change. They believe in making the city a better place. I believe that about each and every member of this council. I think that sometimes people may agree on the why. Why are we here? We're here to make the city better. But they may disagree on the how, and that's okay. That's what we as professionals do, and every member of the city council is a professional. So I think if you come to the table with best intentions, that will help you determine whether it's appropriate, whether it's time to change. And it can also help remind folks who might be invested to consider whether it is time to change. You know, as a litigator, I have to agree to disagree with people all the time. And so doing that as a professional, doing that respectfully means that, okay, we disagree on this thing, but we have all these other things. This is not the only day we're gonna be working together. We're gonna be working together over and over again. And so looking at the long game is really important because sometimes if, if you want change, you have to consider not just the short term, but the long term impact at all times. So. I think reminding people of the why can help you get through the how. Councillor Leo. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I have a question that's, again, not on the list. <laughs> um, so I think we started um, with Mr. Sun, so I will start with you, Ms. Nordyke. Um, so my question for, for both of you tonight is, what motivates you to do the work that you do? I have been a career public servant. I knew by the time I was in high school that I wanted to help people for a living. I knew how good it felt to do volunteer work as a teenager. And I knew that it was just a question of figuring out what exactly that meant. And so my entire life had been taking this broad concept of I wanna help people and funneling it down and figuring out what I'm actually good at and what and where I can make a difference. Because that's what I tell young people all the time who are trying to figure out for themselves what they want to do with their lives. 
Find that intersection point between what you're good at and what you will love to do. And to me, as a career public servant, as someone who has had a steady diet of community service for a very long time, I know that serving my community, the community I was born and raised in, is something that I truly love to do. And seeing an impact is critical, too. It's not just all the feels. It's not just feeling good about it. It's about being results-oriented. And I know when you have limited resources, and boy, do I know that. I know a lot of community organizations don't have a lot of money, but they have a lot of heart. And so I've always been proud to partner with them and volunteer them and even help lead them. I know as being a part of the Department of Justice, where I've worked for the last 11 years practicing law, I know what it's like to work with limited resources. But my colleagues and I have a passion for service. Colleagues like Bonnie Heitch, who is supporting me here. So, and is supporting my candidacy. So I do this because I love it, and it fulfills me on a deep level. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's a great question. I like the open-endedness of it. Uh, honestly, I see Salem as a community that is has so much potential. When I left here, like I said, I was not going to come back for many reasons, but I just wasn't. And now I bring people here to visit our friends and am so <coughs> proud to go out downtown to these places that all of which will hit up on one, you know, Friday night didn't exist when uh, when I you know, was growing up here. Awesome food, great nightlife, incredible parks. But ultimately, what ties all of it together and what motivates me day to day at work and in my life is the people. It's the people that are working tirelessly at the hospital to take care of our community, especially my staff in the finance department that are just so smart and are uh, very dedicated to their work. It's my wife who stays at home with our three and a half year old, crazy, crazy three and a half year old boy one and a half year old boy and pregnant and ready for another, she motivates me. Uh, my parents, my mom's dedication to Salem Health for 40 years on her feet in the operating room, still working, she motivates me. My dad loves this town. Talk about agree to disagree. Him and I have had a couple of good conversations, but he loves this town. The people that I surround myself with at, uh, in various areas of, of the community, specifically Ike Box, Isaac's Room, they motivate me. Uh, and so ultimately what I would say is that just being with people, which most of my day at work is spent in meetings with people, we try to make it fun, we try to make it uh, entertaining, but ultimately we're looking for productivity. How do you measure whether you're on the right path? Making data visible, that motivates me defining a process metric and holding yourself accountable to it, knowing whether or not you've achieved the outcome that you're looking for. That motivates me. Uh, I could go on, but I will say that I really, truly love this town. I love my neighbors. I love, I love all the different little pockets of Ward 7 and all of Salem, uh, and I just, am so glad to be here no matter what. You know, this is new for me. I'm not a career politician. I, I truly am not. But I, I, this is fun to get to say, you know what, I think that my perspective would serve well on this council. I really, really do. And I, I, I say that with total respect and admiration for each and every one of you and how much time you put into this. And it would be an honor, but at the end of the day, I'll still walk away. Tomorrow, I'll get to go interact with a bunch more people, and it will be a great day, and we'll get to do great work. So th that's really what motivates me. Thank you, uh, Councilor Rossi. Thank you. So I guess we go back to Mr. Sund. Um, I've heard a little bit from both of you, but uh, in general, about how the city engages and communicates with people and how some people feel a little disconnected. So just any thoughts you have on what you've seen and how we could uh, do better on our communications. Thank you for the question. 
I think that, first of all, social media, okay? I love that, the fa that this is on Facebook, that council meetings are on Facebook, that uh, there's posts throughout the day, uh, every day almost, that there are people that care a lot about in the city uh, that, um, to get the message out on Facebook. And so I think that's great. I think um, an area of opportunity, and this is in my limited experience, I attended the, um, I, I attended the Sunny Slope Neighborhood Association meeting, and the people that were there are so dedicated and care so deeply about their neighborhood and Salem, and specifically South Salem. And I would love to get more of the young families there. How do we get them there? Well, six o'clock at night isn't really the best time, right? So what do we do? Do we make it more, uh, uh, do we make the access easier? Where is the city's role in that? I, I don't know, but I know that it's important to have input from everybody at that neighborhood association, if at all possible. As far as the city's communication otherwise, I think the one thing that I would say, again, in my perspective, um, from a budgetary uh, standpoint, is you know we're in a difficult time right now where there is a, a budget gap in the forecast uh, the operating fee has been proposed and uh, and approved, and the payroll tax is uh, set to be on the ballot. And so, ultimately, the communication about those things and how we got here, I, again, needs to be as transparent as possible. I, I think that in-person road shows of how we can take the budget on the road is an important way to really let people ask the tough questions about the ROI of our tax dollars. You know, we all just got our, our property tax bill in the mail last week, and it's always sort of a, you know, you get the, the sticker shock and you can't send it back, learned that. Uh, so I think, you know, this is happening on, uh, on many fronts. It's not just city, it's not just the school bonds, it's not, it's that plus everything else. It's the fact that we just wanna know that our community is using our resources uh, efficiently, and so the more communication we can do, the better. There, there is no amount of it that I feel would be unreasonable to really understand where people are coming from. Thank you, Councillor, for the question. So the Salem reporter pointed out that Salem Kaiser students spoke 90 native languages last year. So one of the ways that the city can improve upon its communication is recognizing the multilingual components to our city. And we can work on how we communicate. And I think that we agree that we, why we communicate. It's an, it is vital to demonstrate that the city is making good use of its resources. But how we communicate needs to vary by the communities in question. That some folks don't have an internet connection. Some folks don't have the luxury of watching this broadcast streaming on CCTV. So going out to the, into the community needs to be a multi-pronged approach, a trauma-informed approach, a, an approach that embraces principles of equity and inclusion. A great example was at least holding a forum for the homelessness population at UGM, in theory. I think we agree that there are some lessons learned from that. It makes sense to go to the folks in the community rather than expecting them to come here. And I think as a city councilor, that is something that I would very much enjoy doing. As someone who is proficient in a foreign language, Spanish, as someone who grew up with extended family who are multinational, multilingual, and multiracial, I feel strongly the desire to work with all of our communities, including those who traditionally haven't felt heard or seen. So I think that we need to work creatively on how best to do that, because the established networks do a good job of reaching established communities the neighborhood associations, the Twitter feed, those are all great things. The fact that these meetings are all open to the public, all great things. But looking forward, recognizing that we have communities who interact in different ways and perhaps don't feel safe or comfortable walking into a government building, I think those are some of the groups that we can talk to. 
one of the ways we can increase uh, communication is by increasing engagement, perhaps bringing back the Youth Commission with a special focus on talking to kids who've never even thought about youth in government. I think that this is an opportunity for us to think creatively and to recognize that city is a place of many people from many different circumstances and many different walks of life. This will be really important in working on homelessness issues. Many of those folks, as you know, the root causes are many, but language barriers, socioeconomic status, domestic violence, all of these things are intersection points that make communication even more challenging. So I would welcome the opportunity to sit down with city staff and the rest of the counselors to think outside the box on communication and a wide variety of other things. Thank you, Councilor Hoy. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Ms. Nordyke and Mr. Sun for your interest in applying for this uh, vacant position. I think it's admirable that you're inter interested in serving your community as a city councilor. Uh, I hope you know what you're getting yourselves into. <laughs> So I have a question also not uh, on the prepared list because um, I'm one of the relatively new city councilors and one of the one of the things that uh, has been the biggest learning curve for me has, has been around land use issue, land use issues. So land use decisions are some of the most difficult and technical areas we deal with as city councilors. Neighbors, developers, neighborhood associations and others all have impassioned opinions about how we should grow and what happens in our neighborhoods. How will you approach your decision-making process as, as it relates to land use decisions? So the way that I would approach my decision-making process for land use is the same way that I would approach it for other decisions front of council, which is by doing my homework, talking to city staff, talking with other counselors, going to the neighborhood associations, and going to other groups. I think that when you make land use decisions, those can have a huge impact for years to come. They can, land use decisions can help transform the face of Salem. They can have huge impacts on our sustainability. They can have huge impacts on green energy and greenhouse gas emissions. So those are decisions that need to require stakeholder input from the business community, from families, and as Mr. Sum points out, there's plenty of people out there, plenty of young families out there who cannot come to council when they have childcare needs or they can't come to a 6.30 p.m. neighborhood association when they have childcare needs. So, and of course, those land use decisions will impact the safety and walkability of schools. Are there adequate crosswalks? Are there adequate bike paths? So, Land use decisions are some of the most important decisions that council makes. And so they have to have a careful look at buy-in. They've got to be transparent. You've got to do the hearings. You've got to make sure that everyone in the neighborhood knows what's going on, not just the folks within, what is it, 150 feet or something like that. There's a rule about the notification that says we notify the neighborhood associations and folks within a very short distance of proposed development. But I think we know that proposed development can have ripple effects across the community. So I think that relates back to our interest in communication, especially with young families. I would love to see more involvement from young families in these decision-making processes because they've made decisions to raise their children here. And they've made decisions based on where they think their kids can go to school and can they go there safely. The other factor we haven't talked about yet is our emergency response times. When you approve certain developments that bring a whole lot more people to a certain area, how will our emergency response times keep up with the new demand? Will we have enough fire stations? Will we have enough police officers and community service officers? So land use decisions, you cannot consider them in a vacuum is basically my short answer. And they require a great deal of input. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, ultimately, like any other decision, getting to a consensus, I think that the land use decisions, there's, there's work that has been done prior to that that is important to highlight. I think the R. Salem project that's underway and the traveling, and I look forward to, I think there's actually one tomorrow night uh, at Taproot. Um, 
that, uh, that I plan on attending if I get permission to go, but uh, is a great, abil the, a great uh, way that the city is looking at what does our future look like. Then when presented with decisions relating to land use, who are all the stakeholders and how does this fit into the community involvement and input that we've already received from various members of the community as we've gone out and asked the questions of what do you envision the future of Salem to look like? So I think we can't look at it in a vacuum. I would agree with that. I also think that we need to understand with all the input that we have received on the future of Salem or a particular project, do we feel like that input is well represented by different, uh, different people in different stages of life? Uh, from anyone from living, uh, si single people living at home or young families, retired, the elderly. Uh, I think it's important that we understand <coughs> the five, 10, 15, and 100 year and beyond impact of every decision that would be made. Um, I, would, I would be uh, encouraged to sit down with council, especially uh, those that have been and new to this process of understanding the particulars and specifics of land use decisions and just being a sponge and learning as much as I can about how do we approach this, how do we unpack it, realizing that I know there will be a significant investment of time, especially in the learning curve, but that's really why I'm here personally is to learn and grow in this town, in Salem, and to bring my perspective um, so I don't see it as any different than any other decision other than uh, we must look at all the stakeholders and the long-term impact of the decisions that are made and how does that fit in then with the plan that the community has uh, given input into along the way. Thank you. Councillor Lewis. I too want to thank both of you for your agreement to be here tonight to interview and uh, to serve on the City Council. Um, it is more time consuming than one might think. And now that it is on TV, your family will be watching you. <laughs> um, I believe my first question has been answered, and that is that both candidates are uh, going to be running for this seat um, next year. So that leads me to my, my second question, which is also off script. And as a Ward 8 representative, it shouldn't be a surprise. Um, earlier this year, the City Council voted to not respond to LUBA, uh, therefore requesting that the uh, Oregon Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration uh, finish the environmental impact statement and come to a record of decision under the no-build scenario. So that's done. My question is, do you think Salem needs an additional bridge? And would you be willing to move forward addressing that need? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Am I going first? All right. I'll take that as yes. Yeah. Oh, it is? Yes. I'm so sorry. Please I, go ahead. Yes. I, uh, <laughs> this, I, I thought this might come up, actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I wasn't on council, obviously, so I, I can't speak to every single particular about the ins and outs and specifics. I didn't find myself reading all the documents uh, on Sunday night ahead of council meetings. But I will say, that and I and I plan on uh, saying this throughout the campaign uh, when when uh, when the time comes and as we make our way towards May that yes uh, I do believe that Salem needs uh, a, another river crossing uh, I think that ultimately our town uh, is growing and projected to grow uh, quite a lot and continues to, and we continue to think about, well, how then does that impact? Now, I believe that we need to be looking at alternative transportation. The whole country does, we all do. We have limited resources. But I also believe that when you ask people what bothers them the most, right now, in Salem, what bothers you the most about your experience in Salem, it's, uh, it's the challenges facing our homeless friends and it's congestion. And the fact that traffic comes right through downtown with the bridge does create a problem for a growing city, especially when you have a lot of opportunity 
in your ward, uh, Councillor Lewis, in Ward 8 with the urban growth boundary and the opportunities for uh, expansion as we continue to build and develop for those that are going to continue to move and, and uh, choose Salem as their home. So yes, I do. I, I don't know what that looks like given the decision, but at the end of the day, I, this is one of those things where I think that the different perspectives on council would be good to, towards coming to a consensus of now, now what? Now where do we go? What does Salem want? Where, do, where does that issue fall and how do we get there to be able to support and speak on behalf of all residents of Salem, not just West Salem, but South and everywhere and the communities that surround Salem that rely on, uh, on, our, on our throughway. So that's my answer. Thank you. So I think moving forward, some of the questions we should be asking are, should the cost of a bridge be borne heavily by Salem residents when many Salem residents do not use the bridge on a regular basis? Many residents of Ward 7 do not use the bridge on a regular basis. In the years to come, I believe decision makers can and should review additional river crossing capacity. And I think we need to consider the reality of who uses the bridge now. And many of those folks are not Salem residents. They're on their way to Polk County, they're on their way to Yamhill County. They're on their way to wine country. Their businesses going to and from. And I think moving forward, as we determine and look at additional river crossing capacity, the planners need to set a realistic budget. They need to invite input from the community. They need to consider the impact on homes and businesses and on neighborhoods and on other stakeholders and consider the fact that a wide variety of users use the bridge, some every day as they commute to and from work, some once in a blue moon, and some who only pass through Salem every once in a while. And so who should bear the cost of that bridge? And how can we work together with the fact that a bridge has a ripple effect on multiple counties around us? So I absolutely think we should look at additional river crossing capacity in the years to come. But I think we can do a better job moving forward in determining where and how and when and how much. Now, what that doesn't do is address congestion right now. And right now, there's a lot we can do. Right now, we can use our limited transportation dollars to ensure that children are getting to school safely, that people can walk in their neighborhoods safely, and that we maintain the infrastructure that we currently have, which, depending on where you live in Salem, is not very good or is excellent. We need fresh ideas, like incentivizing telecommuting. How about incentivizing flex time? so that instead of everyone being required to be in their seat at 8 a.m., why not encourage employers to offer 7 a.m. or 9 a.m.? There are some jobs for which that would make no sense, and I'm fully aware of that. But there are plenty of other jobs, a lot of white collar jobs out there, where with a Wi-Fi connection and a laptop, you can do your job pretty much anywhere. So this is where thinking outside the box can do double duty, reducing traffic congestion, and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, something that we can consider as we look at whether to adopt a climate action plan, which I believe we should. We're one of the only major cities left in the state that doesn't have a climate action plan. And we can look at lessons learned from cities with much smaller budgets than us and see what worked and what didn't work. There's a lot more that we can do moving forward. And there's a lot we can do to look at how to ease traffic congestion today, because a bridge is not going to be built tomorrow, no matter what. OK, thank you very much. Uh, did any of you have a, a real pressing need to ask a follow-up question uh, since you didn't get an opportunity? Anything grab you? I'm going to advise you both to look very carefully at land use law. Next time you answer that question on what you're going to do about land use planning, I can tell neither of you have experience in that area. I'll just share that with you. Um, so you'll have a lot, one of you is going to have a lot to learn, I can tell. All right, should we go ahead and vote?
You all have your ballots? Any questions? I gave my comment. I thought I'll, and I thought I'd stay under the three minutes. So. And counselors, if you would sign your ballot. Does it have to be my signature? <laughs> yes, it does. Yes. Just the first one, please. Do you want it in the envelope or? I'll just grab it. The uh, votes are Vanessa Nordyke, four votes, uh, Reed Sun, three votes, and Bonnie Heisch received one vote. Um, Ms., uh, because uh, Ms. Nordyke received a majority of the votes, she is appointed counselor for Ward 7. Very good. It's, it's Congratulations. A major, it's a majority vote, so she re received a majority. I, I, that's incorrect. It's a majority of the votes, so there's a, a four, three, one. So she would. Uh, okay. We're out of here, right? you okay. Want to make sure that... All right. Congratulations. We all. Uh... I'd like to thank Mr. Reed, and Mr. Sund. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll be uh, seeing a lot of each other over the next uh, nine months, so. But thank you, you as well, and congrats. I, I do believe that you have what's best for Salem in your heart, and I look forward to talking and getting to know you more, to hearing more about it. So. Likewise. Buy company shoes. Very good. Uh, Ms. Nordyke, do you want to get sworn in tonight? Yes. Okay. We have another bomb as long as we to go back. He'll be right back with your oath of office. Thank you. Is that okay? We just need to go get a few minutes. Okay. We don't need to wait until we open our work session. Um, that's fine. We can go ahead. Okay. If you don't mind, uh, Ms. Nordock kind of sticking with us here, he'll, he'll be back in just a, the CEO turn will be back in just a few minutes, but we're going to go ahead with our work session and uh, work our way through that one. So I'm going to adjourn this uh, meeting of the City Council. programs. With the change in the schedule, we are breaking this into two separate work sessions. We will come back in March. So this evening, we're just going to cover um, the two items that are the most time sensitive. And that will be um, the Fairview Urban Renewal Area, because that will be coming back to you here in about a month for some, some action. And then also, a proposal that we have um, to incentivize affordable units in market rate development, so affordable housing or single property urban renewal areas. So I'm going to turn this over, first of all, to Annie Gorski, our economic development manager, to provide the update on the Fairview urban renewal area and what we have proposed there. And then we'll follow up with me at the end of the presentation to talk about the affordable housing piece. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Councilor. 
Council. Annie, give me just a second. Oh, I skipped okay. the roll call. Okay. <laughs> so why don't we go ahead, Anita, if you would. Present. Council Gaither. Present. Council Gaither. Here. Council Gaither. Here. Council Gaither. Here. Here. Council Gaither. Here. Council Gaither. Here. Council Gaither. Here. 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 Really? All righty. Go ahead, Annie. Good evening. My name is Annie Gorski. I'm with the Urban Development Department. Um, You're going to have to that good, it's good evening. That's better. Good evening, <laughs> Mayor and Councilor. Council. Uh, as Kristen said, I'm going to talk about the uh, Fairview Urban Renewal Area and a proposed amendment uh, this evening. And then she, we're going to. Um, switch gears and talk a little bit. She's going to talk a little bit about um, a concept we have of uh, developing um, some urban renewal concepts. Um, this is a map of the seven urban renewal areas that we have in Salem. Tonight we are talking about Fairview. Fairview is there in the green. Um, Fairview, since Fairview's um, inception, the assessed value in the area has increased about 845% um, from 20 million at its inception to 189 million. It is also now home to about 4,000 jobs compared to its previous farming use. So Chris, we will come back with updates on uh, where we are in those other urban renewal areas in the spring. Um, this is a photo of the Gilgamesh Urban Renewal, or the Gilgamesh Brewery in the Fairview Urban Renewal Area. This uh, Gilgamesh was a recipient um, of the Fairview Pilot Loan Program that we have in Fairview. Fairview was, uh, the Urban Renewal Area was created in 1984. It's about 390 acres, um, although we have the authority per the urban renewal plan to increase the um, maximum indebtedness, our spending, up to another 6.2 million. We um, are not collecting any um, tax increment, so we do not have that revenue. Um, in terms of revenue or cash on hand, we have about 2 million left in this urban renewal area. Again, we're not generating any new revenue. This is existing cash on hand. It is unspecified in our current year budget. What are we, what we are proposing tonight, um, uh, and would uh, like your feedback um, in terms of an amendment, would um, help us spend or direct the spending of that remaining two million. We would um, prepare uh, following the expender, expenditure of that two million to close the your, your, uh, urban renewal area, address existing loans, that pilot loan program I mentioned. We have three existing loans totaling in about uh, 300,000 remaining that could go um, back to the city or we could um, forgive those loans. Uh, we would also <coughs> modify the urban renewal boundary to fund airport improvements with that remaining two million. So I have a map for you here next to talk what, or to show you what that amendment could look like. Um, this is a map that shows both the existing Fairview boundary in that light black. So I will outline that. This south portion of the airport is included in the existing boundary. I lost my pointer. Here, this is existing. This black line, I don't know where my pointer is going. Here, this is existing. Turner is to the um, <laughs> Turner is the portion that we're adding to the urban renewal area. So we would um, propose keeping the south piece here, keeping the north piece here which is where uh, Gilgamesh and some of the other businesses are located, and then add this area that is the dotted line that includes the terminal building uh, right here, and bring that boundary up 
to, excuse me? I'm not seeing where you're pointing. I can't see the pointer down there. So, uh, Avenue. so this is 25th right here. This is where the terminal building is, the airport terminal. And this is the, um, Okay. <laughs> we're, we're looking for a different pointer as well. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay. The old fashioned way. Okay. Can you see this better? There we go. Okay. So this dotted black line, this is Turner Road up here. <laughs> This is a vacant, so Garmin is right here to the right of the vacant 10 acres, and the National Guard is to the left. So this is the stem that we're proposing to add while keeping these two, the south and north end. So the existing acreage is about 390. When we, um, if we move forward, um, with this amendment and get both agency and council approval that um, urban renewal area boundary would go down to about 65 acres. So we would have some acreage left to both consider um, opening new urban renewal areas or expanding other acreages or other urban renewal areas. By statute, by state statute, uh, we are limited in the amount of acreage that um, we can have in the city in urban renewal areas. Okay. So if yeah. So if we if you could go back to to that map, so I um, just to clarify a little bit. So the the parcel, the large square that we would be adding in, that is one of our closest to being development ready sites at the airport. But there's an infrastructure gap in a lack of connectivity from that site to the taxiway. So the reason for bringing this in would be. So we would have some options for how to use the, that remaining two million dollars. Um, we're thinking that one of those projects would be to construct a taxiway connection. So that would further incentivize development of that parcel and make it even more development ready for an airport user. Then bringing in the terminal building as well would provide us with options to try to um, enter into a public-private partnership to perhaps locate uh, some office, in office improvements constructed adjacent to the terminal. Um, to help support revenue, generate new revenue for the airport, and then keeping that existing area on the south side of the airport in um, because we may also be able to um, help fund or a public private partnership or even just develop outright some additional infrastructure, hangars, buildings to support airport revenue. There's no, no objection. I'm going to interrupt this for a moment to give Ms. Nordak a chance to get sworn in. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ms. Nordak, this is merely ceremonial, so if you'd like, we could do it. You'd be sworn in to what you said in the first session. Okay, so please repeat after me. I, Vanessa Nordyke. I, Vanessa Nordyke. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support the Constitution and laws of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America. And of the state of Oregon. And of the state of Oregon. And the city charter and ordinances of the city of Salem. And the city charter and ordinances of the city of Salem. And that, that I will, to the best of my ability, and I, to the best of my ability, uh, faithfully and lawfully perform the duties of city councilor. Will faithfully perform the duties of city councilor. For Salem, during my continuance therein. For Salem, for my continuance therein. Thank you. Congratulations. Mr. Mayor. Very good. Yeah. 
Congratulations, Ms. Nordyke. That's great. Glad to have you aboard. Now we have nine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Do we want to ask questions now or at the end of uh, Ms. I think we'll Gorski's? take them piece by piece if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, since you asked first. Okay. I'm sorry your pointer isn't working so well, Annie, but the, the one in the middle, uh, the biggest yes. parcel there along, I don't know what, uh, that's the road that goes out by the, that's the way I ride my bike out of town. It goes under Fairview the freeway and that way. Okay. Yeah. Is that in the uh, uh, urban renewal district now or not? That's currently yes. in, yes. So all that would go in under your proposed amendment is Madrona Avenue to the terminal, then across the airport to the, uh, um, the, parcel. the place, the parcel there. Yes, correct. And the airport itself is not in the urban renewal district. Only the southern portion. The Only the part the, that we see yes. there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, Councilor Kayser. Thank you, and just for uh, clarification, so the areas that are shaded, they are not right now part of the urban renewal area? The, the, oh, the, the south end and the north end are. They're yes. shaded because we're proposing to keep them with the amendment. So the north end, do you mean the, the property along Turner Road? Correct. So the, north the end, square property? I mean this piece the, that's kind of like a triangle. Yeah, okay. The dark gray areas would be the after the amendment. Okay. The addition would be the area along Madrona Avenue, the words, the terminal building, okay. and then the dashed line over to the top right piece. That and that brings up my second question about the dashed line. Mm -hmm. Is that, is, is it a dashed line because we're actually hoping to make improvements no. there or is it because they have to be actually contiguous? Correct, they have to okay. be contiguous. So we're making that work. So, how, cherry so how wide is that? Is that like 60 feet or? Or, or is it like a thin line <laughs> it's on a map? I also think part of the reason our consultant um, dotted that line is because it's proposed, right? So the, the, when the, the right. boundary is approved, you would see similar to our urban renewal maps now that are colorful, right, with the boundaries, you would just see... Um, you know, a singular line that yeah. showed that, that okay. boundary, they, but they, we need to connect the two. They right? would typically yeah. be somewhere around 20 or 30 feet apart so that they can write a legal description. Yeah, okay, and have them, that's, that's that what I was wondering. But balance. it's really because it has to be contiguous. It can't be se totally Correct. separate and be part of that's the That's right. Okay, thanks. Councilor Lewis. Uh, a couple of questions. One, um, do we have to spend all of the money before we close an urban renewal area, or can that money be transferred to another area? Um, no, you cannot transfer it to another urban renewal area. Okay. Uh, money that accumulates to an urban renewal area, either through the collection of tax increment or through the collection of program income, has to be used within that boundary of the urban renewal area. You could conceivably dissolve the urban renewal area but those funds would still have to be used within that boundary. Or the other option is that they get returned to the county tax assessor, and then they would be distributed among all of the taxing districts. And a second question, if I could, just out of curiosity, I was stricken by the 800% increase in value. I'm curious, from the beginning, what was the tax or uh, property tax revenue, and what is the property tax revenue now? So um, what I have is assessed value. Okay. Um, the assessed value at the beginning was 20 million, and the assessed value now is 180 million. Okay. So, a lot more property tax significant revenue. I, mean, I just want to use this as an example of the success of urban renewal areas and what it does mean now, as we when we do close it, that's a lot of money going back into the general. So, and. Just to add to that, Councillor Lewis, that m the money is already being distributed to the other taxing districts because we did stop collecting tax increments some years ago on this one. Okay. Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this seems like a fairly tortured attempt to create a, a, a district or a zone. I, do we have anything else quite this convoluted, or do any others exist in the state that are quite this? Oh, the design. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, yes. Um, <laughs> when I when I worked for the city of Wilsonville, we had a council policy that capped tax increment for one of our urban renewal areas at four million a year, and at that point in time, 
statute didn't allow you to under levy and say, we only want four million. We had to go through an annual process of removing bits and pieces from the urban renewal area to keep it that $4 million cap. So it looked like a group of kindergartners sat around the table and kind of sketched it out because it was very cherry stemmed like this. So it's not uncommon. Um, there are other areas too that will create sort of pick up areas through a, this kind of cherry stem process. And what would be yeah. the, uh, the downside to just returning that money and moving on to a new area somewhere else? So, um, the downside is that to, to get the development on that 10-acre parcel, um, the interest that we've been seeing in that piece, it's challenging because of that lack of a connection, and it's an expensive connection. So if we didn't use the urban renewal funds to do that, we would have to look at general fund revenue to do that, or general fund revenue um, for any improvements around the terminal building. So this, the way I'm viewing this is this $2 million that could be invested in airport assets in lieu of using general fund at some point down the road to build those improvements. And the goal of this is to incentivize development on the airport to increase airport revenues to keep it as self-sustainable uh, as possible into the future and not reliant on general fund. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. Council. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. This certainly seems like a gerrymandering to me, and I, just mm -hmm. reading through the staff <laughs> report, my view is we got $2 million. Let's send it back to the other agencies. I think when we're looking at an amount of that size, only $2 million when you just talked mm -hmm. about, Annie, it's $180 million that mm -hmm. the other stuff mm -hmm. is worth. That's a small price to pay to get some more goodwill with the other agencies for a long time who I'm sure have been saying, look, they, Salem has all these urban renewal districts and they keep all the tax increment and it hurts us and we never get anything. So even if it's only $2 million, mm -hmm. I think that's a good PR move. The second question or comment I have concerns the gerrymandering. I mm -hmm. thought when we t you talked about gerrymandering, we were going to talk about the Portland Road one where we went across the freeway. Did and that too, yes. Did that, uh, and we did that for mm -hmm. affordable housing. Right. We didn't do that for development mm -hmm. of something else, mm -hmm. a non-housing. So I was all in favor of that for non-housing. I don't know how much I'm in favor of it here. Another question is, does that rectangle at the top center, mm -hmm. do we own that already? Yes, that's our Portland. Okay, mm -hmm. so if it's expensive to hook up, why don't we just sell it for less? It's airport land, we can't sell it. it, it we can lease it, but we can't sell okay, it. Okay, why don't we lease it for, for mm -hmm. less? Why don't we give them a 100 year lease, or you and Clint can do well, something real creative with that? We, we could, but it goes back to the goal of generating revenue for the airport. Could you also, could you clarify that $4 million? Uh, my, I'm thinking back to the two, Pringle. Two, two million? Two million, yeah, I'm sorry. Two million. Mm -hmm. The two million, uh, when we closed Pringle, mm -hmm. that money went to the city to be spent in that area. Is that the same kind it of seem, process? Same concept. If we so were to close this down now, the two million dollars would come to the Urban Renewal Agency, but it could only be used within that boundary. That's, I think that'd be the problem with trying to get goodwill with anybody so, else. So I, I just want to make sure that's clear. If we, if we returned it all to the other taxing bodies, it would be divided, you know, seven, eight different ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Councilor Lewis? Yeah, I guess another question, $2 million, is that going to buy the connection to the property so it will be ready for development? Our cost estimate for that connection is around eight hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. Um, then the other item tied to Fairview is, as Annie mentioned, that there are three outstanding loans. If 
these businesses had been located in our other urban renewal areas that have grant programs. These would have been grants instead of loans. This is the only urban renewal area that's had a program quite like this. The combined total outstanding balance is around $300,000. If we're looking at closing this urban renewal area down soon, we would have outstanding balances for a number of years beyond that. And there is associated staff time when um, loans get refinanced, when they bring in new partners, um, and going through that process. So uh, the other proposal um, that we would make is that we would just forgive those outstanding balances and treat them in a similar fashion to our other urban renewal areas so that we wouldn't have um, to keep, keep that accounting open for another 10 years or so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councilor Anderson. Thank you. I'm looking at uh, page to um, fourth paragraph uh, about there's no other identified projects and the amended will add acreage to the boundary to mm -hmm. include the air part and reduce acreage in the other areas of the URA. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is if the amendment is done, mm -hmm. only the th four shaded areas mm -hmm. in the dotted line will be in the U Correct. URA. So what is being reduced is all the good stuff that gave us $180 million of tax valuation. That's right, yes. Okay, any, any further questions? And this will, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so I actually have a follow-up question mm -hmm. uh, to Councilor Anderson. And the next statement, um, in terms of where the money was going to be going, it's going to be going, for example, to needed airport projects, mm -hmm. incentivize new development, and generate new airport revenue. Mm -hmm. Is there an idea of what needed airport projects um, or some examples based on those three um, key pieces? Yes, there are three things that we've discussed um, through the development of the airport business plan. So we've been working on a business plan for the last year or so. And that has identified a few, um, a few needed improvements or investments that would benefit future, um, future growth of revenue at the airport. So one is that taxiway connection up on the 10 acre parcel that I mentioned. The second is in the terminal building itself. The terminal building, like many of our facilities here, like this building, has um, a lot of, it is, has deferred maintenance, it's gonna need new roof, new siding, a, a, a lot of work um, to repair that. So what we've considered with these funds is, well, we couldn't use those funds for repair and maintenance. We could use them um, to try to bring in a private sector partner to develop office space on that site where off the airport administration would occupy some of that space and the rest of it would be leased out space to provide new revenue. So that would be another example. The third example is in that southern area that's already within the urban renewal boundary um, would be to use some of these funds to develop or incentivize the development of um, smaller flexible industrial space because there is a demand for that within the community and then as the uh, owner of the land or possibly even the buildings then we would receive that lease revenue to support the airport. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any? Yes. Councilor Osik. And just to take that one step further, so what's the expected ROI? You're talking about putting a couple million dollars in and we've been talking about how much the URA grows the, the value there, so. So, um, so in this situation, um, because we've stopped collecting tax increment, we're not looking at growth in new tax revenue um, in the sense that we do normally in an urban renewal area where you invest the money and then you have growth within that URA because um, we're, we're on the shutdown path here. But if we're looking at just the growth in revenue to the airport, um, we have not drilled down that far. We've identified three options, but we haven't gone into the point to analyze which of those investments would pencil best. Um, because there are so many variables right now that we don't know, I'd say we probably would have the most information on what development would look like on the 10-acre parcel. And that would just be straight 
uh, directly a land lease revenue to the airport. Um, and we have you know, information on lease rates on the airport. Um, so that we could come up with an ROI and come back to you pretty easily for that one. The other two options, whether it's new construction at the southern end, would depend on whether or not we are acting as the builder owner of new construction or just the landlord for the, the raw land and incentivizing that. Those would have different returns and we haven't explored that yet. And then the other return, if we were to do something around the terminal building, um, again, there are a few different variables because some of that space we would be occupying. And it depends on whether or not we were to just build and occupy for um, airport administration. We've been talking with um, the Oregon Department of Aviation. They're looking at doing a new building on the site as well, so we'd like to explore whether or not we could join forces and share space, or if we would look at just bringing in a private sector developer to partner with us. But there's so many variables along that path that we're just not there yet to have a clear answer on what the ROI would be on all those variables, various scenarios. When will we see the business plan? What's your... I'll turn to Annie. The draft is out for review. We received review. We're mm -hmm. formatting the final um, the final document. So I would say within the next two months. Oh, great! Month okay. and a half. Great. Will that uh, will that help with this in terms of just putting it all into a, a kind of plan? Then uh, what we'll see more where you're going with these kinds of. Um, uh, or is this it? Th so this would come back to the council, well, to the Urban Renewal Agency Board in December to initiate this process. Okay. Um, this is informed somewhat by the airport business plan because it identifies the need for additional revenue to support airport operations and identifies opportunities, but it doesn't get deeply into ROI for all of these different scenarios or recommend one over another. But we will have your business plan in advance of this coming to the agency for a decision. Is that, do if, I understand if, you? If that is what you would like, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we had planned on bringing this back the first, well, it's, it first meeting in December. I'm hearing, yeah, it's, I, uh, I would say that, that, do you think, so we were looking at yeah, having, having this first week of, or the first meeting of December, we were thinking the airport business plan would be December, January. We could push this out to bring the airport business plan back first. Well, is this time sensitive? Do you have we, a developer waiting? There's a developer that's interested in that 10 acre parcel that we've been working with for a number of months that would need a connection either there or we've also looked at whether or not they could be sited somewhere around the terminal okay. building. Well, I hope you'll inform your decision by that opportunity more than a desire to see the business plan, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it seems to make more sense in terms of what we're after here. Counselor. What is the reason that the Gilgamesh area that you pointed out, the triangle on the upper left, why is that still in? That seems to be pretty developed. So the simple answer to that is that when we were first contemplating the amendment, we were looking at taking out the southern area as well. And so we needed to anchor the expansion into the existing sure. urban renewal area. You couldn't and get the square and the terminal into it unless you had, uh, even for us, that would be too attenuated right. to run it all the way down to the southern area. And then as we were exploring it just in the last few weeks, um, other development opportunities and looking more closely at that southern end, we decided it would be better to keep that in as well so that we're not precluding any opportunities. So, you know, I, I noticed you said, well, we, we're going to do this and we're trying to get additional revenue. And mm -hmm. I just, and maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And if I'm wrong, I'd love to know that I'm wrong. But it just seems to me in the time I've looked at mm -hmm. the airport, we're always looking for additional revenue. So what's to say that we spend all this money mm -hmm. and then five years from now, 10 years from now, you're coming back and saying, we spent all this money and we still need additional revenue because the airport really is not producing revenue. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't have any problem at all with the uh, in light industrial down at the bottom there. Mm -hmm. That's part of it, the project, mm -hmm. and and that is sort of independent of the revenue. I expect uh, uh, maybe to the extent that some of the light industrial is going to use the rev uh, use the airport, but that's not necessary uh, mm -hmm. necessarily. So so. You know, I've already stated this, but I just have concerns about the top end of it, and I don't have so many concerns about the bottom mm -hmm. end of it. And my concern is, are we really going to just be pouring this money out there and not really see an appreci appreciable increase in additional revenue? And if there's a business plan that shows that, that's great. But I suspect there were business plans before in the development of the airport that showed we're going to get all this new revenue. And why are we coming back then saying let's pour some more urban development money into it? We can definitely provide what we think we would generate in lease, new leases to you quite easily based on the 10 acre and the additional acreage at the south. One of the key recommendations in the business plan is just to look at um, developing more vacant or underutilized land. And that's with the aim of increasing um, lease revenue at the airport so that we can continu continue to sustain operations as we grow. I'm sorry, one more, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Well, I can't say, when a lawyer says a few more questions, yeah. you know you're in Just trouble. Keep going. So you're saying that the area above Garmin, you're in discussions with somebody else who clearly wants to be near the airport, who clearly would want to be near the interstate, why don't they go to the southern end there? They need runway access, and just because of the configuration, it's much harder to get that from that southern area, some of that sort of outside the fence. So you're saying the cost to get that is, is, would be greater than the cost to make all the improvements we're talking about here? Yes. Okay. Yes, and then the FAA's process. Okay, right? that'll so be in the business yeah. plan too, or an explanation of that? It, it would be in a staff report. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else? All right, let's move on. All right, part two of this is, um, a new program that would help us address our affordable housing needs within the community. So the city already has uh, a few different programs that we have available to incentivize affordable housing or how multifamily housing. We have the MUTIP program, and you um, have processed a couple of those awards here within the last year. And that multi-unit housing tax incentive program that's tied to a geographic boundary that's largely the center of the city, the downtown area. Um, that's really about incentivizing housing development around transit. So that's why that boundary is kind of the downtown core. Um, we also have the low income rental housing property tax exemption program that was, let me, so the MUTIP, let me go back to that for just a moment. That's a, ta a 10 year tax abatement. <coughs> then we've got the low income rental housing property tax exemption program that is only for um, nonprofit owners of affordable housing. And that is a program that they have to apply for every year, but they can do that. Um, there's really no sunset you know, to that program. That can go on for a number of years as long as they meet the qualifications. Then the Salem Housing Authority has a program, um, and you've also seen some uh, recent awards there, where it's a, um, a community sort of partnership program where the owner entity pays a fee to the housing authority and then can benefit from the housing authority's tax exemption. That program has a number of different tiers of um, of affordability and property tax abatement benefits ranging from a full exemption um, to a 50% exemption, depending on the number of units um, included in the project that are affordable and the percent of AMI. So what we're proposing here is an additional program that would use the urban renewal tool to incentivize affordable units in new multifamily developments that could be developed anywhere in the community um, and not have that same sort of geographical constraint that the MUTIP program has or have the um, requirement to enter into an agreement with the housing authority of, that the community partner 
agreement has and that would have a simpler structure so that um, instead of seven or eight tiers it would be a simpler matrix to determine the affordable affordability levels so in this scenario we would establish a program where a single property urban renewal area would be established after negotiating agree an agreement with the developer and prior to the start of construction. So when you're still dealing with the, um, the raw land value. So that would establish your frozen base based on that, the assessed value of the land. And then when the, um, the multifamily development is developed and on the tax rolls under this program, they would pay their property taxes and then they would receive a rebate back through the Urban Renewal Agency. That rebate would um, be dependent on the number or percentage of affordable units within that development. Um, so the table that we have proposed uh, after some consultation with developers about you know what would pencil in a pro forma would be um, an AMI averaging at 60%, so maybe they would have some 30% units, maybe some 80% units, but the, the average would be at 60% of the median income. Um, for a 20% of the units being uh, affordable at that 60% AMI, then we would provide a 97% a rebate. And then we would have two other tiers with 12% um, of the units would generate a 77% rebate or 8% of the units would generate a 57% rebate. So that's kind of the draft matrix that we've uh, run through some developers in, and it seems to pencil and make sense to them. Um, the table that is within your staff report is for a 200 unit development. Um, I think for this to work, we would need to limit it to maybe a minimum of 50, a 50 unit development. Anything smaller really doesn't pencil too well. Um, so we were looking at this with so the pilot project out on the north campus of the state hospital where there is a subdivision that is currently underway with a, about a 240 unit multifamily housing development planned. And so if we were to put this in place throughout the spring or before the June 30th deadline, uh, we could enter into a development agreement with those developers to provide this type of rebate in exchange for getting affordable units within that complex. And then we could replicate this program and offer it to developers throughout the community to try to get that mix of affordable units within market rate units. Um, one thing that we hear pretty co commonly is that um, we need more affordable units dispersed throughout the community. So this is one tool that could help incentivize that. Yes. I've got a lot, but I'll just ask one and then go oh, around. Okay. Yeah. My first, well, my first comment is I wrote down North Campus on here, and so I'm glad to see you've got that because the developer there, I think, could very well be interested in this. Second one is when you're talking about the rebate on 97, 77, 57, is that on only a rebate on the portion of the property taxes that are can be attributed to the affordable housing units or is that a rebate on the entire? So in other words, at 97%, they're only gonna be paying 3% of their taxes? So it's, yes, it's a rebate on the entirety. The entire so project. like, and that's similar to the MUTIP. So okay. Which yeah. is, but it's for 10 years for the MUTIP. Okay, okay. I'll defer to the other counselors okay. for now. Councilor De Young. Thank you. Um, so my question is, is this only going to be for new builds going forward um, if it's passed? Yeah, it only works for new property because of the structure of urban renewal. You have to have the urban renewal area established prior to the property coming onto the tax rolls so that you've got that growth in assessed valuation that you could then rebate back. Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to circle back to Councillor Anderson's question because I, I, you gave a different answer than I expected. 
So I thought that you had said earlier that this would apply only to the affordable housing portion of a development. You're saying that they would get a rebate on the entire, so on the entire property. So let's say they had two units out of a hundred, they would get the entire property uh, return, uh, the tax return. That's not what I thought this was going to do. No, it will. Um, it would be twenty units out of a hundred. So it's a twenty-unit minimum. So if, let's no, say it's, it's so the it's a the percentage. So twenty percent. Oh, twenty percent of whatever their total development size is would so, then generate the ninety-seven percent rebate. So twenty percent affordable housing will get you ninety-seven percent rebate yes. on your taxes on right. the entire property. Right. So right now with wow. our Moo Tip program. It's 100% rebate, but there's no affordable requirement. Right. Thank you. Councilor Lewis. And I'm, yes, Councilor Lewis. No, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that this is pretty consistent with the program that we have in place through the Housing Authority. It's just three tiers instead of, I think, seven tiers. Okay, I, I appreciate the, and I'll refer to this as thinking outside the box. This is so far outside the box, I don't even know if it's in the same room. So, if I understand it correctly, urban renewal areas, one of the main criteria is to improve a blighted area. Mm -hmm. We seem to be going, drifting away from that and using the need for affordable housing as the reason for using urban renewal funds. The second thing is when we identify the blighted areas, they are they're specific areas. This seems to be a revolving. Uh, wherever you can put the affordable housing, that would be your urban renewal area. And my concern is that purists who see urban renewal areas for a specific reason will will think that we are venturing too far away. So respond to that. Sure. So state statute um, does require blight findings. State statute also speaks to using urban renewal for the development of affordable housing or for use by housing authorities. So that's not a departure from, um, from statute. And the blight findings would be written um, to address the lack of affordable units within the community and that, that this would be addressing that element of blight. Um, fortunately, it, within the state of Oregon, the definition of blight in urban renewal statute is extremely broad and it's essentially up to each agency to define it within that plan. And that's how we would look at defining it. Councilor Kayser, did you? Yeah, thanks. I, was, I think you've answered my question, which is the MUTIP program. It sounds like this is a similar. Um, one of the differences I see is the MUTIP is a 10-year property mm -hmm. tax abatement, and then we're you're done after 10 mm -hmm. years. You're not getting a rebate. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Correct. Okay. And then with this proposed, it's a maximum of 30 years mm -hmm. um, for that the affordable housing, essentially. Correct. So I did have a question mm -hmm. about just um, do we have developments in town now where something like this has happened where there's affordable units within market rate developments? Yeah, so the, the projects, um, and I have just blanked on the name of the one that came through here just within the last couple of months that came through the Housing Authority through their Community Partners Program, but it has the mix of um, affordable units within a market rate development. So one primary difference between the Housing Authority Program and this is that um, the Housing Authority program is a tax abatement rather than a rebate. And so that program w does work for um, existing properties. Um, and then the MUTIP is also an abatement rather than a rebate. So just on the ground with mm -hmm. the affordable housing mm -hmm. units intermixed with mm -hmm. market rate, what does that look like? Is, is that just like a, a cheaper unit or like I guess I've, I've mm -hmm. never seen mm -hmm. one maybe or been pointed out obviously like this is the affordable housing unit versus this no, is the market rate. Right? So like they're generally fully integrated within the development so that you don't know which one is the affordable one or the not affordable one and they're expected to be built to the same standards. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I see. They're just going to offer a certain percentage at 
Correct. An affordable so, rate. Yes, they okay. would have to target it to tenants at a certain okay. income level. So it's not like mm -hmm. it's going to have different finishes or right. any of that kind of stuff. Yep. Okay, thank you. Could you, uh, uh, Kristen, could you describe uh, programs we have in place that will result in affordable units at any kind of quantity? I mean, or do we have uh, uh, substantial programs for affordable housing available to us? So the, the Housing Authority's Community Partners Program, which has um, an incentive, a property tax abatement incentive. I guess I'm, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of the, the type that actually we're getting development uh, occurring around mm -hmm. those programs. For new, new projects that we're seeing yeah. um, that, are con that are being constructed by the private sector, very little here recently. Um, the Cornerstone Apartments, yeah. that's, that's really the only recent one that really falls into a fully affordable project and that came with a lot of public subsidy through urban renewal and through um, the lift program through the state so this is something as you guys looked at this approach you were looking at it as a how do we get affordable housing built in some quantity in town along with other kinds of housing mm -hmm. which tends to help with at least creating a market that allows for Differ so, a differentiation of rents. Correct. So another tool to get it um, dispersed throughout the community and not just in certain yeah. areas of the community. But then another reason is that there is a lot of, of um, data now that shows that when you integrate affordable units into market rate developments, it, it helps bring people up out of poverty. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Um, I'm all for rebates to bring affordable housing. Uh, just a different end of the scale to me than what we talked about at the airport development. And I don't mind giving 97% to somebody who's a rebate to somebody who is going to develop 20% of the units. Um, can we go, why do we go with the 20% as opposed to going higher? Why don't we give 90% at 30% of mm -hmm. the units and then move down? Could you discuss that, please? Uh, the, yeah, the reason that we landed there is we've had a bit of back and forth with developers just about the okay. pro forma and okay. what, what pencils, what okay. they could make work. And then uh, uh, we're talking about, you know, creating these new sort of mm -hmm. pocket urban renewal areas. Well, mm -hmm. and the mayor asked about what's going on with the mm -hmm. private um, folks, and so I just immediately thought of a Coe's development, mm -hmm. which is in an urban mm -hmm. renewal area. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the other developments that have been down there are pretty much market rate mm -hmm. from Park South all the way up to, I don't know what it's called, but Paul Gaylor's mm -hmm. thing. Um, so if we want to disperse, is it still possible to hold conversations with these people to say, look, you can get 97% rebate on your taxes if you just make 20% of your units affordable? Conceptually, yes, but in these particular cases, um, they've already Time benefited from the MOO tip. Okay, and okay, they got, have, it, got it, yeah. got it. Then the final question I have is one of the, the, the big uh, problems mm -hmm. with affordable housing is how it how it pencils out mm -hmm. and this is obviously a way to get that mm -hmm. but I also know that one of the big problems is the cost of the land mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so does the city own some land someplace in in our urban growth boundary mm -hmm. that we can say this might be someplace where we can make it some sort mm -hmm. of uh, uh, affordable housing and either make it a uh, you know a pocket urban renewal district or just say mm -hmm. we will give you the land mm -hmm. which will allow you know the 50 percent of your construction to be affordable housing as opposed to five percent or ten percent or some other figure in one property where I think that um, that we do own and that we could look at that but we wouldn't need this model is um, the property that we're acquiring or where the UGM is and the Saffron property. So as we start looking at future development plans there, I think affordable housing is certainly something. And that, that is in the downtown. So that Correct. was that. Yeah, mm -hmm. And so you could start with that right. as opposed to coming into the the late the back end of projects. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes, Councillor Hoy. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on, uh, I had sent you a request uh, a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly when, uh, regarding disbursement. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you if there was been any progress on that, because I think that's something that other counselors might be interested in as well, to know, you know, how dispersed are we? We don't, we, we all kind of have our own ideas, I think, in our head, but it would be really nice to have actual information. So I'm just curious about that. And then also, um, how will these individual urban renewal areas impact our ability to create other urban renewal areas should we close down one? I mean, are, in terms of acreage, is it going to be significant? Do you have a, an idea how much that's going to be? So projects like this, I would say on average, we're going to be looking at anywhere from eight acres to 15 acres. and. For example, this one here, we can certainly do within our existing capacity. Um, we have the 15% cap on how much land we can have in urban renewal areas within the city. We're at about 13%. When we remove that acreage out of Fairview, that's going to free up quite a bit of capacity. So, you know, we would have the capacity where we could do a number of these smaller ones. Um, you know, this isn't something where we're going to be having people just, you know, lining up and beating down the doors to do this. But it would be a tool that when we're in conversations with planning and they're talking about a new development coming in, wherever it is, that then we could present as an option to try to get units there. You know, and it might be five, seven, ten of those coming up over the next decade, maybe. Thank you. Just to follow up, mm -hmm. and I apologize if you already answered this, but has, is anybody else in Oregon doing this, or would we be the first, or where did we get we, this idea? Yeah, so we would be the first for doing this for affordable housing. We wouldn't be the first doing the single property urban renewal areas to provide a rebate. Um, so this idea came out of work that I did in Wilsonville. Coming out of the recession, we had a lot of 2 million square feet of vacant industrial space. And so we established a program similar to this um, to incentivize investment in those big vacant warehouses. Mm -hmm. Hey, any, yes, Councilor. And I just wanted to get a sense of what the program would look like to administer this as in the sense of for 30 years, are you going to be checking uh, on these things and how is that kind of are going to work and are they going to be adjusted? Do you mm -hmm. just move them down a tier if they start offering less uh, affordable housing units or how does that get enforced so that mm -hmm. they continue to provide that benefit that we're looking for? So we foresee administering this in conjunction with the low-income rental housing uh, tax exemption program um, where we do annual check-ins and um, verifications that units are still affordable and uh, site inspections. So we would just sort of bundle this administratively with that program. And then in terms of the affordability threshold, um, conceivably, a property owner could opt to go from 20% to 15% and have that adjusted. It would be, I think, challenging because they are going to be using that basis um, in putting together their financing package. And then um, the 30-year the period, um, the developers are interested in that 30-year time frame because of the SDC waivers that we offer for affordable development. So they would want to keep units af um, affordable for that 30-year period so that they could benefit from the SDC waiver. That's all part of the pro forma as well. Um, they could sell, you know, they could refinance, and the units could go back to market rate, and they would, we would unwind, close down the urban renewal area, and they would forego the rebate. But I think it would be challenging for them to say we want to go from 20% to 15% with how their financing would be structured. I just meant more if they, you know, people try to do things where, well, now I've got the rebate mm -hmm. on the books, I'll just start charging market rate for everybody. Mm -hmm. So if your review finds that yes. they're charging market yeah. rate, that there would be some repercussion rather than yes. just. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Oh, Matt asked it? No. Okay. Anything else then, Kristen? So our next steps is that we would plan on bringing both of these back to initiate the process in the December time frame, And um, with approval to do that, then move through the amendment or creation process uh, early into the next year and into the spring. Um, and then we will also be back in March to talk about opportunity zones, enterprise zones. Our enterprise zones are gonna be up Oh, they're on a 10-year renewal cycle. Those are coming up for renewal through the state. And our other urban renewal areas to talk about the um, grant and incentive programs. Very That's good. It. All righty. If there's no further questions, we are adjourned. <laughs>